Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to our live stream today, um, the KDBAI live stream on multimodal RAG with images and text. My name is Neil Canungo. I'm your host. I'm joined by data scientist Ryan Sigler. Ryan, you want to say hi to everyone? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, th thank you all for joining today. We got uh, quite a few registrants today, and we're excited to have you all uh, joining our session. Uh, today, we're going to go over two approaches to multimodal RAG. We're going to be going over uh, a couple embedding approaches and how multimodal RAG works with both images and text uh, with the vector database. Um, as we give a, a few minutes for people to join, I thought I'd give a little bit of an intro about who we are and uh, just spend a couple minutes on that. And then we'll jump into the uh, uh, actual session where Ryan's going to overview uh, the multimodal RAG approaches. So um, with that, um, today uh, we are um, talking about uh, doing multimodal RAG with KDB AI. And KDB AI is a vector database that specializes in temporal capabilities uh, and temporal similarity search, but also has uh, extensive uh, multimodal RAG capabilities and RAG capabilities for those of you building RAG applications. And so you can go to kdb.ai on your browser and you can just sign up at the top right. You'll be presented with three different options. I recommend using the cloud. The cloud is limited in memory and storage, but it's really easy to get set up. Um, so it's a good way to evaluate KDB AI. Um, and then there's a server where you can download uh, a server deployment and that you can scale to higher memory and storage requirements. And uh, finally, there's KDB AI, AI in the Azure AI tech stack. That's an, a third option for you as well. But again, I recommend using the cloud. I think that it's the easiest way to get started. Um, when you sign up, you just fill out a simple form uh, with your information. Uh, you'll get an email address uh, asking you to confirm, or you'll get an email uh, asking you to confirm your email address. Um, once you confirm, you'll get a getting started email. And from there, you'll be presented with uh, the cloud UI where you can get your API endpoints and API keys. Um, just grab those and uh, you know copy it somewhere local, uh, like a notepad file so that you have it for your records. Um, and we also have a quick start guide in the UI uh, that shows you how to create a table, how to load embeddings into your vector database, how to do similarity searches, any prerequisites you need. Um, if you do get a not running at the top of your um, uh, interface, um, may, that, that might be because you signed up a while ago and you just haven't been active. Uh, just email our support with um, the support email that's given in the little information icon and they'll turn on your instance, no problem. There is no time limit on uh, using your uh, KDBI vector database is not time box. As long as you're active with it, we'll keep it running for you. So um, very appealing for those developers that are experimenting with uh, a lot of different approaches um, or trying to test uh, use cases that they can take into production. I uh, wanted to let everyone know that this session is recorded. You can find it on the same link on LinkedIn, or you can find it on YouTube at our YouTube channel, KX Systems. The link there is shown on the screen, and you can catch the recording um, and jump back through the session um, however you'd like, um, and that should go on within an hour after the session airs, and YouTube usually gets it up. We are parallel live streaming to YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter and LinkedIn right now. So you can join from any platform of your choice. Also wanted to let you know, just the last little uh, um, tip is our KDB AI community Slack. That's open to everyone to join. Uh, if you have questions on you know, your vector data, database applications, your generative AI applications, go ahead and ask there. Um, we have many engineers that are uh, online willing to help you with any challenges you might have or provide tips. Um, and Ryan and I are on there as well. So it's a great way to reach out to us and uh, get feedback. Um, so with that, I'm gonna launch into our feature session and um, Ryan's gonna be presenting the uh, power of multimodal RAG. Again, we're doing this with just images and text today, um, but feel free to ask your questions in the chat and we will answer those questions live. Uh, so just 
put them in whatever platform you're on just put them in the chat and uh um yeah let's go ahead and kick it off uh ryan over to you all right sounds good well thanks for the introduction neil appreciate it and thank you all for joining uh, i think this will be a pretty interesting topic today so um i'm a data scientist at kx and uh we're going to be talking about multimodal rag uh, with images and text using kdb ai as well as a couple different embedding models and large language models and uh, we're going to get into you know what is multimodal data and uh, why is it important um, but really at a high level um, it's this concept of uh, ingraining human-like perception in our applications which should help uh, the results that we're getting so uh, the agenda is I'm going to start out with just a high level understanding of vector databases to make sure we're on the same page there. Talk a little bit about the KDB AI vector database. And then I'm going to do a architectural walkthrough of how retrieval augmented generation works. Um, so this is the idea of linking your own data with a large language model and allowing that large language model to answer questions about your data for a user. And then we'll get into the multimodal data piece. Talk about what is multimodal data, why is it important, how can we use this with our AI applications, and then at the end, sort of tie it all together uh, with multimodal rag. And there's a couple of different methods that I'm going to uh, walk through of how we can try to do multimodal rag, and uh, each of those methods consists of really the two key steps of retrieval augmented generation, which is number one, retrieval, which is getting the relevant data from our vector database, and then generation, which is sending that data to the large language model, where then it can um, generate a response for our user. And after we go through the, these slides, I'm going to walk through two different coding demos um, on uh, one for each of those methods that are described in the presentation. So with that, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, so first of all, KDB AI, that's our vector database. And uh, of course, uh, it's great at doing semantic searches, or it's sort of the, one of the main use cases of, of vector databases. But like Neil mentioned, uh, one of the other uh, key differentiators that we have is the ability to handle temporal data, whether it's time series data or data with metadata fields consisting of date time data types. We can handle all of that um, inherently and that's built in. So uh, a really good solution if you have data that's time based. Um, but uh, one of the key use cases that folks are using vector databases for now is uh, RAG. And that's powering large language models with our own uh, data that those models have not been trained on. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, especially the multimodal data aspect of that. Uh, but there's several other use cases that um, aren't related to large language models specifically that vector databases are also capable at for example anomaly detection um, image similarity search pattern matching recommendation system sentiment analysis so there's many different use cases that you can use vector databases for aside from just rag um, so uh, just a little high level description there of, of our product and our vector database and i, I know you already went over this uh, but we got several options for you. Uh, great getting started point, kdb.ai cloud version here, easy to get started. We have uh, GitHub with several different uh, code examples, including the ones I'm going to go through later. Uh, so you can get uh, instance spun up and uh, build out your own RAG pipeline um, in a matter of minutes. So it's really easy. It's really fast to get started, uh, especially for experimentation. So check it out. All right, so uh, let's just get an understanding of vector databases, vector embeddings, and why they're important. And this will feed into how we use that uh, in retrieval augmented generation. And then of course, multimodal RAG as well. So a vector database is just a database that holds vectors. And uh, why, like, why does this matter? Why is this important? It's important because when we have our own data, whether it's text, images, audio, video, any other types of data, we can store that data in a vector embedding format within our vector database. So what is happening here is we can take our raw data and we pass it through an embedding model. And an embedding model is just a deep learning model um, that basically 
transcribes our original data into a vector embedding format. And the vector embedding format has a couple of key attributes that make it particularly powerful. And that is we are representing the original data in a numeric machine readable format uh, that represents the underlying inherent meaning of that data. So what that means is if you had a text document, you run it through a text embedding model, that vector embedding is not specifically going to represent the, just the keywords within that document, but it's going to re represent the relationships between the words and the importance of specific words. And that is going to give you a true semantic meaning of the underlying document. Um, so it's, it's more powerful in a sense than just a basic keyword search. And these vectors, you can think of them similarly to like 2D or 3D vectors that we worked on back in math class, but uh, these vectors are vectors of many dimensions. So it could be hundreds or thousands of dimensions. And that's of course a little bit difficult uh, as humans to imagine in our head, but uh, machines can understand this and this can be stored as vectors in a vector database. So once we have all our data stored here in a vector embedding format, then a user can query this vector database with a question or a query vector. And what will happen is we are able to understand and return what are the most relevant vectors within this vector database. So it's a very powerful form of finding the most similar data that's held here. And then this is returned as query results uh, for your application um, or you know whatever use case that you're working on. So that's a high level of a vector database. And, and how does this fit into this concept of retrieval augmented generation? So if we look at this diagram, um, the whole point of RAG is to introduce our data, which the large language model hasn't been trained on, to that large language model. So we want to ensure that our large language model is able to answer questions about our own data. And to do this, we have to present our data to that large language model. And retrieval augmented generation is a method to do just that. So there's two main steps, like I mentioned. First off, retrieval, which is where we are retrieving the relevant embeddings from our vector database. And then generation, where we're presenting or augmenting our large language model with those relevant documents. And how this works is we start out with our data, and then we need to chunk it up into smaller pieces because uh, a large language model has a limited context window it's unlikely we can just pass all our data into it at once. So we need to chunk it into smaller, more digestible pieces. And then we take those chunks and we embed them into our vector embedding format. And then we store those in our vector database. So at this point, our vector database holds vector embeddings representing our original data. So now a user has a question about our data. They ask that question in natural language. And then that question is embedded the same way that our data was embedded. Um, and this allows us to do a semantic similarity search between the user query vector and all the vectors in the vector database. And what happens then is we can retrieve the most relevant vectors to the user's query. Um, so this is that first step, this is retrieval. And then of course, we just pass that as well as the user query to our large language model. And then our large language model is able to create a response for our user. And there's uh, th this method is, um, I would consider to be naive rag. So uh, there's ways that we can improve this. This is like uh, sort of a general way to do it. Uh, but things like metadata filtering, re-ranking, um, generating multiple queries from a single user query. These are all different methods on how we can improve our rag pipeline. And if you're interested in learning more about ways to improve rag pipelines and, and circumvent some of the uh, difficulties and pain points, uh, we have a session coming up next week um, uh, with Wenshi Glance, which will really dive into all these pain points. It should be really interesting. So sign up for that if you're interested. Uh, but um, now that we have an understanding of retrieval augmented generation, let's talk about multimodal data and what is it and what are some of the difficulties that it presents. So multimodal data is simply multiple different types of data. Uh, so audio, text, video, this is, the, each of these are different types of data and all these together could be considered multimodal as they are different types of data. And the way we would like store all of these 
into a vector database would be we could run them through their own uh, specific embedding models. So audio could have a uh, specific embedding model. Text, there's a lot of different text embedding models out there. Videos and images, uh, different embedding models. And of course, we get our vector embeddings. But the problem is that because these are uh, these vector embeddings are created with different embedding models, we really can't put them together in the same vector space. It's not going to work to do similarity searches between these different vectors that were created with different embedding models because they weren't created with the same model and they're not within the same vector space. So uh, that's that's really the problem initially with trying to do RAG or trying to even just do retrieval within a vector database on multimodal data. So how can we potentially uh, work around this problem? And that is, of course, using a multimodal embedding model. And this is just one of the methods I'm going to talk about. But the idea is that there's embedding models that are trained to embed multiple different types of data. Uh, and they can do each one and, pro and produce vectors that live in the same vector space. So really, the goal of this is to represent all these different data types uh, within a unified vector space. And because then they're all within that unified and shared vector space, uh, we will be able to do effective similarity searches uh, against each of these types of data and return the most relevant data to our user, regardless of the type of data that it is. Um, so th this is the first method, which is using a multimodal embedding model uh, to do this for us and create this shared uh, these shared vector embeddings. And I'm trying, um, as we go into the multimodal embedding models, um, are there a lot of multimodal embedding models out there, or is this relatively new space? I've seen uh, Google Gemini and uh, a couple others starting to pop up, but wondering what you know about the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. And there, there are a few out there, but um, I would say it's early days still. Um, you know, there's there's a handful out there that are, I would say most popular, but as far as uh, open source uh, multimodal embedding models, there's really not not a ton to choose from. Um, like uh, you have uh, ImageBind, which is one from uh, Facebook Research or Meta um, that we're actually going to be experimenting with today. You have Clip from OpenAI, which is another one. Uh, Gemini, I believe, has a um, embedding model as well. Uh, but other than that, you know, they're few and far between, which is why we're going to be talking about. Um, another method to go about this um, as well. And, and that's the second method, um, which is the idea of unifying the, um, the modalities before we run them through an embedding model. So uh, in this case, we still have our, our different modalities of data, uh, but say we just want to use a text embedding model. Um, there's a ton of text embedding models available, closed source and open source, fairly, very highly performant. And uh, we may just want to use a text embedding model. And how we can do this is we would just need to change all of our different modalities into the text modality first, and then embed those using a text embedding model. And then we have a shared vector space where we can do similarity searches between all these different modalities, even though they're really represented by text. So if we think about how this would happen, if you had an audio file, you could create a transcription of that in text form or maybe a summary of that in text form. You have your text, we could, this can just be sent directly into our text embedding model. And then images and videos, uh, you can create summaries uh, for these. And, and really you could do this manually if you wanted to, or you can use a large language model uh, to do this for you. So either so way. A, so we had a question, sorry to interrupt. But no, no. I, I think we're, we answered the question just as it came in, but Matthew Bashara was asking, do they directly embed video, audio, or they generate text descriptions? And I think that's what you're showing is the two different approaches. Um, the first approach does directly embed audio and video um, as well as text. And um, this second approach is a, a transcription to text that then gets embedded, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. So yeah, we're just, we're with, with this method, we're just putting everything in the same modality before we embed, then we embed 
And now we can have vector embeddings all within the text embedding space. But really, these text embeddings represent the original uh, multimodal embeddings. So at this point, when we do our similarity search on the vector database, um, we're going to be able to effectively find the most relevant vector embeddings, and then we can return those to the user. Uh, but the beauty of this is we don't just need to return the summarizations and the transcriptions. We can return um, a link or a path to the original data itself. So say we have a, an image that gets returned as a most similar embedding. Um, we can return the summarization, yeah, but we can also return a path to the original image too. So like in this case, if you wanted to pass that uh, image on as an output, you could do that. Or if you wanted to pass the image into a large language model, a multimodal large language model to complete the RAG pipeline, you could do that as well. So this is like one element, uh, one section the, uh, of the RAG pipeline. And as we explain this further, it's going to make a little bit more sense on, on how we're storing all of these into a vector store, into our vector database. And then we can do retrieval on that vector database. And then after retrieve, we retrieve, we pass that to our large language model for generation. And so Mohan was asking, and I think you're, again, going into answering this question as the questions are coming in, but at the end of all, all this, they're all, all the, at the end of the embedding process, all the embeddings are, uh, are uh, stored in the same vector space, right? Within, they're not, you're not using different embedding models, so you're not getting different vector spaces, correct? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that that's right. That, that's sort of the initial problem of uh, if we use different embedding models, we're not really going to be able to store these all in the same vector space. It's not going to work uh, because they were they were created by different embedding models that were trained in different ways. Uh, so that's the that's the beauty. If we have a, a multimodal embedding model, which is our first option, this is able to put them all in the same vector space. And then in this method, we're just putting everything in a text form at first and then using the same embedding model to create our vector embedding so we can serve them in the same vector space. Great. And Vijay was asking about performance. And I was just going to say, um, if you uh, stay tuned to the session, we're going to go over some uh, sample demos and you'll be able to get a sense of the performance from there. Um, and then Ryan can talk to any other uh, performance evaluations as well uh, when we get to that point. Perfect. All right, cool. Well, yeah, keep, keep the questions coming. Uh, happy to answer the best we can. Um, so yeah, so let's uh, let's just look at this at like a high architectural level um, as far as the retrieval side goes. Um, so this is each of these methods just in the same document or in the same uh, illustration. And because of this, we can sort of see where they differentiate. Um, so we have our data. Well, we might extract different elements from our data. We might have images, uh, tables, text. And once we extract that, there's the two paths we can go down. And, and we'll go down the top one first, which is just using a text embedding model. So that is putting all of our data into a text format first and then embedding it. So we can chunk our text. We can summarize our tables and our images all within text format. We can do this manually. We can do it using a large language model. And then we pass this to our text embedding model here, uh, which would embed all of our summaries, descriptions, and text. And then all of these embeddings would be stored in our vector database, which is, of course, in the same vector space. So because of this, we can do similarity searches over uh, all of these different types of data represented as text embeddings. The second method where we're using a multimodal embedding model, uh, here we're taking our text and our tables and we might just pass the text directly or chunk it up. Depending on the situation, we could pass a summary of our table or we could potentially pass it raw. And then we have uh, images. But in this case, we don't need to do this initial step of summarization for our images. And that is because this embedding model is gonna be able to take the images in as is. So we can pass the images straight into the embedding model as well as our text and table summaries. And then this will do our embedding, store everything in the same vector embedding space in KDB AI. So regardless of the method that you use, uh, you're going to be able to do a similarity searches over these different uh, types of data together. And that's that's really the core of multimodal retrieval. So moving on to the generation step, now that we have, regardless of the method, right, now that we have these vectors stored within KDB AI, uh, we can do our retrieval to get 
those relevant embeddings out or those relevant pieces of data out and then generation by passing that to the large language model. So if we have a user query asking questions uh, about our data set, um, this would be transcribed into a embedding vector or a query vector. Similarity search against our vector database, which would retrieve the most relevant and most contextual pieces of data, whether they're text, images, audio, video, whatever it is. And then we can pass these most relevant pieces of data to our large language model. And uh, there's a couple of different ways we can approach this as well, because there's different types of large language models out there. You have large language models that are more text-based. And in this case, uh, you know, you would you would just send the summaries directly and you wouldn't be able to send in uh, raw images or video or anything like that. Uh, but if you had a multimodal LLM that can handle all of these different data types, uh, what you could do is you could pass in the actual raw underlying data itself to the large language model for generation. So this completes our retrieval augmented generation pipeline. All right, so this is the slides Slide here. And here and let's go ahead and get into the code, unless there's any questions, happy to answer. There are a couple questions. Uh, so we get a break right before we jump into the code uh, and the examples. Um, Chandra was asking, is there a way of prioritizing the type of embedding? Uh, for example, like having text taking more priority than video. Um, and this is uh, to drive better accuracy among different data types. That's an interesting question. I, I think you could do this. Um, you might what what you might be able to do, and this is just my initial thought on this, is you could use metadata fields uh, that are attached to these vector embeddings uh, and have a weight associated with it. So say you wanted videos to have less of a weight than text, uh, you might be able to assign a smaller weight to those video embeddings rather than the text embeddings, um, a potential way to do it. Yeah. And then Vijay was asking about the uh, results of the current image description and table summarization models. Uh, they haven't gotten as good results with the transcription of base approach. And I think this is where we're going to see um, probably a, a more optimal approach is using that multimodal embedding model itself rather than the text-based uh, model, um, because you're naturally going to have a compression of uh, data and the loss of uh, information when mm -hmm. you are going from uh, an image to a text summarization and then back into uh, an embedding versus going directly to that embedding, um, just by the nature of the way the embedding models work. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, uh, And I, I agree with that completely, I think. Uh, it also does come down to the multimodal embedding model that you're using um, and the data that you're using too. Uh, it may be a case where you might need to do some sort of fine tuning on that multimodal embedding model to really optimize it for your specific use case as well. Great. Cool. Let's, uh, let's get into the exciting stuff. Let's go into the code. All right, let's do it. Okay. So we're going to start out with uh, the first method, which is uh, taking all of our data, turning it into text, and then embedding that text with a text embedding model. And then the next demo will be using image bind as a multimodal embedding model. So uh, first, we're going to just do a little quick setup. And I've already done some of this just to save us some time here. Um, so I'm uh, just going to make sure I got that run. Um, so this is just our imports, getting our open AI API key set up, um, and then um, getting our client set up with, with open AI. And you're going to see how that's used in, here in a minute. But uh, the next thing that I'm going to do, and, and before I begin, if you're interested in trying this yourself um, and maybe you know making some changes for your own use case, this is all available on uh, uh, the KX GitHub. So we have a samples folder up there that has several different examples in it. And this is uh, both of these examples are up there if you're interested. Yep. And I, I did put that link in the chat for those that have uh, joined on LinkedIn. You can see our GitHub. It's github.com forward slash KD, KX systems forward slash KDBAI samples. Perfect. OK, so uh, to begin, we're going to create a couple of functions uh, that are going to help us out later on. And, and you can look at the top two functions here. And these functions are going to be to create our image summarizations. 
And the first one is a function to encode our images. And what this means is we have our raw image um, from a path, and we're going to put this into a base 64 encoding. And so this is just a method to uh, encode an image into like a text format and to a specific encoding. And we do this because the way that GPT-4 vision works, which is our multimodal LLM that we're gonna to use to create our summarization, it takes in images in a base 64 uh, encoded format. So all we're doing is we're just gonna pass in our image path to this function. It's gonna create this base 64 encoding for us. And then we're gonna pass that encoding into this image summarization function. And we're gonna pass a prompt, which is gonna be create a description of this image. And what this what happens here is uh, this function will then use GPT-4 vision preview uh, to intake that image in its encoded format and create a description of that image for us. So these are what these top two functions are doing. And then we have another function that will just extract text from a text files. And then we have another function that will do our embedding. So this is where we're actually embedding um, our text, which is both our text files that we're going to be using and our um, image summarizations that we're going to be using. So before we get any further, let me just show you what the data that we're working with is. And this is just example data. You can come in uh, and try this out yourself and use your own data. Um, but uh, in this case, we're going to be using images, just a few images of different animals um, that we have available to us here. And uh, also we will have text descriptions of each of those animals as well. So this is the data that we're working with just to show this, uh, both of these examples. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, run these functions here. So um, now let's get our data all set up. So we're going to get a list of all our paths for each of our uh, images in our text. And then we're gonna create a data frame, uh, which we're gonna use to hold all this information as we build this out. Um, so we got everything set up now and let's go ahead let's go ahead and try this out. So what we're going to do is we're going to loop through all these texts. We are going to find the path. Uh, we are going to give it a media type, which is text. And then we are going to extract the text from that uh, path using the helper function from above. We then will pass that ex extracted text into our embedding model to get our embedding. And then we can store all this information in our data frame and concatenate it to our data frame. So let's go ahead and give this a run and see what happens. All right, well, it went pretty fast. So let's see what's in our data frame. All right, cool. So this is an example of what we have in our data frame so far. We have the path to each of these text documents. We have our media type. So we know what we're working with is a text. We have the actual text that's held within those files. And then we have the embedding em embedded vector format of that text. So we're building out a data frame of all the data that we're going to then insert later on into our vector database. So now we got our text. So let's try for our images. Um, so what's going to happen here? I'm going to run this. This is going to take a, a, a little bit to run. Um, but we're looping through all, all our images. And uh, we're getting our path. And we're getting our image type, which is just defined as images. And like I said, the first step we need to do is encode that image. So we're going to take that image path, pass it into the coding function, and we're going to get out that image in a base64 encoded format. And then we're going to create a prompt. So say describe the image in detail, for example. And then we're going to create a summarization. So all we're going to do here is pass in our encoded image and our prompt into our summarization function from above. Uh, this is going to intake both of these. It's going to use GPT-4 vision preview and create a text summarization of our data. So at this point, we have a summarization of our image. We then can pass that summarization in its text format to our embedding model, same embedding model that we used above. And this embedding model is then going to output our embedding, and then we can put all of this information into our data frame and concatenate uh, that new row on. So while this is running, we can I've already got uh, the results from an earlier run printed out for us. Um, and what we can see here is uh, we have our original text, uh, but we're add, uh, in addition adding on these image rows to our data frame. 
Um, so we got our path, we got our image, and then we have the image description that was created uh, from running this through GPT-4 vision preview. And then we just took, all we did is we just took that text and then we created embeddings from it. Um, so it just finished. So let's just make sure it worked well. Okay, perfect. So, yep, everything's good. We got all our data stored in our data frame. All right, so now let's get our vector database set up. Uh, so I've already run this initial setup here. You, uh, When you uh, sign up for KDB AI, you're gonna get your KDB AI endpoint and your API key. Um, and then you can use that uh, to set up your environment here. And then we just wanna connect to that environment and we run that. And now we need to create a schema for our table. And what, what we're gonna do here is just take our uh, columns from the data frame above, and we're gonna create columns within our table for each of those. So we're gonna have a path column, a media type column, the text column, and then of course the embeddings column. So this is, this is the uh, important part where we store our embeddings and we have all sorts of flexibility in KDB AI to uh, determine how we want to set this up. So depending on our embedding model, we're gonna have different number of dimensions. We're going to use whatever search metric we want. We can use cosine similarity. We can use dot product. We can use Euclidean distance. It depends on the use case. And then we have options for different types of index. Uh, here we're just using flat because we're not using many files, but you could also use like HNSW as well and some other options. So the way you set this up is up to you and all dependent on your use case. But uh, this is the schema that we're going to use to set up our, uh, our vector database table. All right, so now we got our schema defined. Uh, let's just make sure we don't have any tables that uh, exist of the same name. And it looks like we're good there. So let's go ahead and create a new table with that schema that we just defined here. So this will just take a second. And um, what we'll see, and I'll go show you here in a moment when it's once it completes, is that this table will have been created. And you can actually go in uh, to kdb.ai, sign in, and you'll be able to um, you'll be able to see all this information. So um, here you can see the multimodal was just created for us, shows us our index type, our distance metric and our dimensions. And you have the capability to uh, delete the file from here as well, if you, or the table from here as well, if you wanted to. All right, so our table's created and now let's insert our data. So we're taking that data frame and we are inserting it into that table. We have it, uh, I've got it batched out here. Of course, this isn't really necessary because we're not, we don't have many ro rows, but in the case that you did, you could use a method like this to, to batch out how you are inserting into KDB AI. And then let's just take a look here at the table. So in this case, we're just taking a look, making sure the data got into our table okay, and it looks like perfect. We're, we're all set, everything's in here as we would have expected. Okay, so now our data is stored in our vector database, and let's let's do some uh, let's do some retrieval. So uh, the data we're working with was animals, um, and there's some pictures of deer in there, for example. So I'm I'm asking a question that's like uh, about deer, but you, not using the actual word deer. And uh, what we're going to do here is just create a query vector of this uh, natural language uh, query. And then we're gonna do a semantic search or a similarity search atop our vector database. And what we get, we can see, oh, it, it seemed to work pretty well. We get our deer, we get a deer text uh, return, we get in, uh, two deer images returned. So it seemed to have picked that out of the other images and text uh, options pretty well. And if we wanna actually take a look at what that returned for us, we can see, okay, uh, we got our, deer description and we got two images of deer. Pretty cool. So the re retrieval seemed to work really well. And now let's let's complete that rag pipeline. So we've retrieved our deer images with our uh, with our query. And now we want to send this off to a large language model. So we're going to define a function here that's going to help us to do this. So we're going to define a function called rag. And what's going to happen is we're going to pass in our retrieved data from above. So we're going to pass in this data and then we're going to pass in a prompt. And all this is going to do is build a query for us. It's going to send it off to GBT4 Turbo and we're going to get a response back. 
And then uh, let's create the prompt. What is the purpose of having antlers? What we asked above. Uh, we can create like a system prompt as well um, to attach this to. So you will answer, answer the given prompt using the attached content and then append that prompt there. Pass that into our rag function and get a response. Um, so let's run this and check out what we get. So this will just take a couple of seconds here. So this is, again, this is just reaching out to GPT-4 with our attached data and our prompt to generate a response for us. And of course we get a pretty good response. It gives us several different reasons that deer have antlers. So pretty interesting. Um, and this would complete our rag pipeline. And then at the end, of course, we should table as good practice. So before you drop that, I think um, <clears throat> it was interesting in the LM response that it says at the top of your LM response, it says, the purpose of having antlers for deer as illustrated by these images and the provided information is multifaceted, et cetera, et cetera. So it used these image, the images in part of the prompt for generating, um, generating that result. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. You know, it specifically points that out as we asked it to in our, pro in our prompt. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a great evidence that it's, it's doing what we want it to do. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So that's our, uh, that's our first example. And let's, uh, let's get into the next example. So this is doing it uh, with multimodal rag with a multimodal embedding model. And we're going to use a multimodal embedding model called image bind. This is a, a really cool embedding model that was created by uh, Meta. And uh, if you're interested, uh, you can check out that repository right here. Um, but uh, I did a little preset of work to get us started. So uh, we just had to clone in that repository, switch in, uh, switch to that directory and do some installs to make sure we have everything we need. Uh, we then would uh, do our imports um, to get all of the packages necessary to complete this. And we uh, instantiate the model. So at this point, I've done all this already because it takes a few minutes to run through this and download the model. Um, but at this point, what we have is our um, image bind multimodal embedding model available to us and uh, the model variable. So what we can do is we'll do a similar method where we're going to define some functions that will help us out. And the top two functions, again, these are used to produce our embedding models. So what we're going to do here is we're going to pass a path to our uh, to this function. So the path to either of those data sources, whether it's an image, whether it's a text, doesn't matter. And then we just tell it what type of data that is. And then we use this function to set up uh, our data to be sent into our image bind uh, embedding model. So once we have this data set up correctly, we will call the above function. And then this function will pass that set up information to the multimodal embedding model, and we will get our embedding and return that. So the goal of these two functions is to input a path to a, to a file of either an image or a text and output an embedding, uh, a vector embedding for that data. And then um, we'll do a similar, uh, a similar method for our query vector. So when we're having a natural language query, well, we can pass that into this and get a query vector out of it. And we'll use that when we're doing um, retrieval. And then, of course, we need our just a file that will extract text from a text file for us. So these are the functions we're going to use. Let's run that. All right, awesome. So uh, we're going to do a similar thing. We're going to define a data frame um, that has the columns that we need for this. So we have our path, we have our media type, and then we'll have our embeddings. In this case, we don't have the text column because we're not going to have text for images. Uh, so we're not going to put that in there. And then we're going to get our paths to our data that we're going to be working with, both those images and text. And then let's let's try this out. So we are going to loop through all of our images and we're going to get our path. We're going to get our media type. We're going to pass this path and the media type to those helper functions above, which is going to output a vector embedding for us of each of these images. We then will store uh, all that information in a row, which will be appended into the data frame that we defined above. 
And we can see this worked actually pretty fast. And if we take a look uh, and see what's in our data frame, we can see that the images have been stored in there with the path, the media type, as well as our multimodal embeddings from ImageMind. So now we'll just do the same thing for the text. So we'll loop through all our text, get our path, get our media type, send that directly to the embedding model. It's going to be able to embed this and we'll put all the information into a data frame row and um, concatenate uh, to our data frame. And it worked very fast and we can see um, the data frame now contains information on both images and text. All with vector embeddings that will work in the same vector embedding space from a multimodal embedding model. Okay, so now we will set up our vector database again, which I already did this step, um, and then we will connect to it. We will create our schema similarly to the other method, but in this case, we're just going to have two uh, metadata columns for path and media type, and then the embeddings will be stored here as well. And what you'll see here is that the number of embeddings is 1024, which was actually different from the embeddings model that we used earlier, which was open AI embeddings model. Uh, in this case, it's image bind and image bind outputs a different um, number of dimensions um, in its embedding. So we just have to document that here when we're creating our new schema. All right, so we got that schema created and we will make sure we uh, we'll drop the old table here. And then um, after this, which will take a couple seconds just to reach out and uh, ensure that table is dropped. Um, then we will go ahead and create a new table with the above table schema here. Perfect. So we'll create that. Now we'll create the new table. And once this table is created, we'll go ahead and just insert that data frame into the table. Um, similarly, again, this is batched um, for a larger data set. So if you wanted to experiment with your own data set, this is already all set for you. And you can see um, now we've inserted our data into our KDBAI vector database. And we can check out, let's just make sure everything's in there. Yep, all good. So all of our data is now in our vector database. So now we can do retrieval. So we're going to just make a function that will help us view the results at the end. Um, but uh, let's let's have some fun here. Uh, create a query vector large brown furry animal and see what happens. Um, so we get our search. This will actually query the vector database and get our results. And we get a picture of a bear, a picture of a bear, and a picture of a fox. So kind of worked. Uh, I mean, the fox kind of is somewhat looking brown and furry here. Um, not as large as the bears, but uh, kind of interesting to see that. Uh, now let's try brown animal with antlers and see what we get here. And yep, that worked pretty well. So we get the deer description as well as some pictures of deer. And now let's try a different example, green and yellow insect that cocoons. Give this a run. And we see that we get a caterpillar uh, description and two caterpillar images back. So uh, this was retrieval from the vector database. You can see it, it seemed to it seemed to work pretty well um, in, in most of these cases. And now let's go ahead and uh, do some uh, uh, generation. So let's complete the right pipeline. So in this case, I'm going to use Gemini, uh, which is a multimodal uh, LLM, it's a Gemini's vision model. I've already done some imports for us, got our API key all set to go. So um, let's go ahead and give this a run here. So we're using uh, Gemini Pro Vision as our multimodal LLM. And we're going to uh, write a function that will set up our information to pass it into Gemini. And we need to do this because the way that Gemini intakes um, data is in the form of a list. So what we're going to do with this function is we're going to build a list that we then pass to Gemini. And the list is going to contain first the user query and secondly, all of the data that we retrieve from above. So it's going to take uh, basically our user query and then all of these uh, Caterpillar data, whether it's the text or the images, it's going to take them in as their original data form. 
And um, so this function will create that list for us. And then let's let's do it. So we're gonna create a prompt. Uh, can you tell me about the caterpillars and the images? What species are they? So we're, we'll actually dig into them and ask it to really answer a, a pretty complex question about the specific images. And then uh, we'll create that uh, sort of system prompt that you're saying answer uh, based on the attached content and put that all into a list, run that through our setup function. And now, once we have this done, we can actually pass this into our vision model and see what we get. So we are now doing generation, passing in our retrieved data to Gemini, and we'll see what it says. So let's see, we got, so the first image shows a green caterpillar with black stripes and white spots. It says it's a tobacco horn room. And then it looks at the second image and it shows, gives a description of that and says it's a fall webworm. And after doing a little research on my own, that actually is correct. So it was able to uh, figure out the species of the caterpillars within those images. So that that leads to the rag pipeline for uh, the image bind method. It's pretty impressive, and it's cool to see uh, you use the Gemini model, um, the Gemini uh, um, multimodal uh, uh, model in this uh, example. Um, I think. Uh, this is really opening up a lot more for what AI applications can do, yeah. making them more immersive with the different modalities that humans interact with. We interact with not just with text, but you know, or speech, but with audio and um, images and video. Um, and I know we just did, we didn't do much on video. Um, Matthew Bashara was asking, um, uh, can, you know, can you use Gemini for video or, would you pass screenshots of a video into a still picture model and summarize? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know this was just with images, but if you have any comment on that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, a, you know, video, I think uh, there's, there's different ways that you can approach do, doing video, but as, of course the most basic one would just to be uh, split it up into images and, and do it with specific images. But I've seen certain methods where you could take like, um, you could take uh, the image of within the video that you're interested in or the frame you could say, and then you can look at the surrounding frames as well to add additional context when you're building the embedding for that uh, specific frame. So I would say um, there's several different methods you could use to do that. Um, but uh, I would look at some different research articles. I think it's kind of early days for that, but there will be methods. There, pro there are some methods already, and I think uh, there will be more impressive methods coming as well. Okay. And then last question from Abilash. Um, he was asking, um, is there, and I think we covered this in a past session, but ways to extract um, information from images in a PDF. Um, so I think that has to do with how the libraries they're using to process your PDFs. There's like PDF to text and there's yeah. like Py PDF, I think. Um, there's mm -hmm. a you know, few Python packages for extracting information out of PDF. Um, I think that is one of those uh, misconceptions with uh, RAG and uh, generative AI is that you could just dump your PDFs into an embedding model and get results. Um, you actually have to do some data pre-processing to get the right context out of that, whether it's images or text or tables or things like that. Yeah, that's, so, a, that's a great point. And, and another method for PDF extraction I've seen is um, a, a company called unstructured.io um, they they have it seems to be a pretty substantial pdf extraction um, methodology so and take a look at that as well yeah cool um so just to um kind of close things out um letting everyone know that again um uh, we have all these sessions recorded and uh, hosted on our YouTube channel. This one should be up in the next hour on YouTube as YouTube finishes processing it. You can also watch this in the same link that uh, you might have found on LinkedIn. Uh, but be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we, we do a live stream every week or every other week. Um, and so we got quite a few of them going on this year uh, and a few, quite a few that we did last year. So it's a good way to kind of stay plugged in. Um, and then also just... Uh, um, a little heads up about our uh, Slack channel. If you want to get help with um, your vector database applications or anything related to KDBI or general um, 
generative AI applications, our Slack channel is great to join as well. Um, last thing just to note is that uh, next week we are uh, going to do another session. Ryan's going to join us again. Um, and we have Wenchi Glantz, um, who you may all be familiar with. She writes um, some pretty awesome Medium articles. Um, and uh, she did a really great Medium article that was featured on Towards Data Science on 12 RAG pain points and proposed solutions. So as you're, you're trying to take your RAG applications into um production and you're trying to like uh fine tune different experiences or refine different experiences not necessarily fine tune but um in the context of fine tuning models but um as you're trying to refine different experiences with uh your rag workflows this will be a really great session to learn some practical hands-on um tips and tricks for your rag workflow so i encourage you all to join that and um, um thank you all for joining today uh, thank you, Ryan, for that great presentation. Uh, you can find the Jupyter Notebooks on our yep. GitHub again. And um, yeah, thanks again, Ryan. And we will see you all on our next session. See ya. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Bye.